Good morning, Prime Minister. How was dinner? Good morning, Madeline. Dinner was uh, very good. It was uh, very convivial, uh, very constructive, and I look forward to working positively with uh, state and territory leaders. Uh, we did have a, a, a very pleasant uh, occasion last night. I hadn't met the Tasmanian Premier, uh, Jeremy Rockliffe, before. Uh, all of the other leaders were very familiar to me and it was a chance to sit around uh, the table informally and to talk about today's meeting, but to also talk about how we can improve federal and state relations in the longer term. Well, we've got a very big agenda today, so let's get straight into it. Uh, so AUMO has said that since it intervened, there are promising signs in the East Coast energy market. Uh, are, as we go to air this morning, are we still at risk of blackouts and load shedding on the East Coast? Well, what we know is that these are difficult times. IEMO has had to make this uh, intervention to ensure that the market was suspended, to make sure that the system continued to operate properly. There was a bit of gaming going on of the system, which is why IEMO used the tools at its disposal to intervene. So we do have these short-term issues. In the long term and medium term, we know that we need to move on from the, the climate wars, which have been such an issue over a period of time. Uh, we need to move on from this conflict. We know that the cheapest form of new energy is clean energy. We need to make sure that we get that investment, that we have battery storage, that we ensure that the transmission grid is built up for the 21st century. And that's why yesterday it was so pleasing to have the Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the NFF, the Australian Conservation Foundation, the ACTU all say, yes, they support uh, Labor's policy that we took to the election. That's now the government's policy. That's now Australia's policy of a 43 per cent pledged by 2030 with the mechanisms in place to drive that investment. So I'll get to renewables and that investment in the, a minute, but that's medium to longer term. In the short term, how are you going to ensure that we don't continue to face this, this huge risk of blackouts, brownouts? We've heard of businesses saying that they're closing because they're not going to be able to get continuity and certainty over electricity. In the short term, how do you manage that? Well, by doing exactly what we have, we've backed IEMO uh, with this intervention to make sure that businesses can get power, to make sure that households can get power. But when, it, you, when that comes off, when that mechanism uh, comes off, uh, whenever that may be, well, well, it, what, do, what do you do well, then? Well, it'll stay in place. IEMO have made clear that it will stay in place uh, while, while ever it is deemed to be necessary. But what you can't do, what I can't do is stand here in my office in Parliament House and create a new power plant or fix a transmission grid. And, and it's just dishonest. The problem is we've had 10 years of denial and delays. We haven't had the investment. We haven't had the grid fixed. Uh, and as a result, uh, we have problems with the energy system. We had 22 policies announced and none landed. And it's just dishonest uh, if I would stand here and say, I can create a new power grid uh, while um, you know, in a day. It, you simply can't do that. So what we needed to do was to have the short term uh, measures in place, uh, but also to make sure that we get that investment so that in the future uh, we don't have these problems. Uh, part of the problem with renewables up until this point has been the amount of time it actually takes to get them on. And, you know, as we are so beh far behind in our establishment of renewables. If you speak to any energy expert, they'll say it's actually going to be a real stretch for us to meet those newly uh, signed up targets with the amount of renewables and the trajectory we're currently on. How are you actually going to materially drive this investment to change this? Because there needs to be so much money put into it. Businesses telling me uh, that it will happen. Uh, I was in Gladstone just two days ago, and there you have Rio Tinto is Australia's largest energy user. Uh, there at the Yarwin uh, Alumina Refinery, uh, that employs their three plants in Gladstone alone, employ 4,500 people. They're looking at powering uh, their processes uh, with wind and solar, uh, backed up in terms of for security reasons uh, by, by gas. 
and they're looking at that investment. Uh, they're looking at over a, a double figure uh, billion dollars in investment. Once you have uh, the policy certainty, you will get that investment. That is what business are, are, are all saying, because they know that the alternative is either to shape their own future, to make sure their businesses can grow, or they will go backwards. Standing still is not an option in today's world. And that's why uh, business has welcomed uh, our plan and the government's plan moving forward. Uh, Prime Minister, a little bit earlier, you, you effectively said that the generators have been gaming the system. Um, if so, will you actually let us know who those generators are? I mean, are you considering naming and shaming who they are? Um, and I can they actually I be trusted? I email have let all that know. I email have, have let... But, well, the system was designed such uh, that there wasn't... Uh, there was almost a, a, a disincentive uh, for it to, to operate properly in the circumstances which were there because of the way that the price mechanism was working. And so uh, that's why IEMO have intervened. We'll look at any policy changes that are required there as well. Uh, but uh, the weaknesses that are there in the system have been well known for some time. What we've had previously, though, was a government that pretended that it was all OK, pretended that uh, they had a policy when they didn't, they had 22 different announcements and didn't land one, and as a result, uh, we've had uh, a problem created by that almost decade of uh, denial and delay. Uh, what we need to do is to bring that investment on to make sure that the system is built for purpose for the 21st century. Can I just move to health? Um, because that's another issue that the states are particularly keen to talk about. Uh, they want essentially 50-50 a split of funding for hospitals. Uh, are you open to that, given the huge burden that we're currently seeing? I mean, just on, in COVID alone, 200,000 people with COVID at the moment, nearly 3,000 people in hospital. Well, there are real pressures on the health system and, and we understand that that's the case. Uh, but when you look at those pressures, it's not just a matter of hospital funding, it's the way that the health system is operating in general. There are, there are a whole lot of people who turn up at emergency departments uh, because they can't get access to a GP. Uh, that's why we announced during the election campaign our urgent care clinics. Uh, that's why we announced our, our Medicare uh, strengthening GP payments as well for every GP clinic in the country. Uh, that's why we announced $750 million no, those are uh, to all go into term, our strengthening those are all Medicare term as well. They're not, longer, they're not longer term at all. Well, they're not longer term at all. They're not longer term. Uh, that funding uh, starts to flow. It's about the way that the healthcare system operates immediately. Uh, we'll have discussions today about uh, the pressures that the system are under. Uh, we know that the uh, COVID payments in terms of the hospital system are due to end uh, at the end of September. Mm. That was something that was put in place uh, by the former government and we'll have constructive uh, discussions about that this morning with state premiers and, and territory leaders. OK. Uh, just a, a final question. It's the first time we've had a chance to speak to you since we got the unemployment rate um, down of 3.9%, continuing that level, and also uh, since uh, the Fair Work Commission awarded that uh, wage rise of 5.2%. There are a lot of very happy, low-paid workers in Australia at the moment, but how... Can you make sure that this doesn't just lead to some sort of inflationary spiral? Well, you look at what the Fair Work Commission head, Ian Ross, said himself in the statement, uh, that uh, this wouldn't be uh, inflationary. This was in the context of uh, a, a relatively low uh, unemployment rate, which is there. And they made the decision that given the cost of living pressures that people are under, if you didn't have at least a 5.1% increase in the minimum wage, what you'd be saying is that people who are the lowest paid workers in this country would get a real wage cut and they couldn't afford to do that. So I welcome the decision of the Fair Work Commission. Uh, it was based upon uh, their assessments about 
uh, the economy and the impact on it as well. Uh, what we need to do uh, in uh, the medium and longer term, and I'll be talking with premiers and, and chief ministers about this today, is that if you want to increase profits and increase wages, the key to that is boosting productivity. Mm -hmm. And we need a productivity agenda. And I'm pleased that uh, the states and territories want to be a part of that as well. All right. It's a very, very big and important meeting with a very long agenda. Uh, we'll let you get to your busy day. Thanks so much for speaking to us, Prime Minister. Thank you very much.